In the world of social media, we look at people that visit different places and we tend to believe that all of the world is accessible to us. But in today's video, I'm going to shatter that illusion and share with you the top three different places that you can't go, but people went there anyway. But before we start this video today, if you're a fan of the strange, dark and mysterious delivered in story format, then I would hardly consider you subscribing to my channel. And without further ado, let's begin. There is this tiny, lush, heavily forested, beautiful island 93 miles off the coast of Brazil that, no matter how beautiful it looks, no one will go on this island. In fact, they're not allowed to go to it because the Brazilian Navy has forbid it. So the legend of this island really began in the early 1900s when a local fisherman was off the coast of the island and saw right on the edge of the forest were these beautiful banana trees with all these bananas that were ripe and ready to be picked. And he thought I could easily pull my boat over to the those rocks hop over and grab some bananas and bring them home no problem that'll take me 10 minutes to do so and so he pulls over by himself to get these bananas he anchors his boat he walks up the beach he climbs up the tree and he starts hacking down some bananas and while he's up there he suddenly feels a sharp pain on his ribcage and he falls out of the tree he looks down and he's bleeding out of his ribcage because he can see it on his shirt there's blood on his shirt. He thought to himself, was there a branch that jabbed me in the side? Like what was that? And he's alone. He's 93 miles from the mainland. And so in a panic, he ditches the bananas. He runs to his boat gets it unanchored and starts making his way back to the mainland but on the trek back he passes out in the boat later that day another group of fishermen see this boat kind of drifting around some rocks and it looks like something's wrong so they make their way over to it and there's uh, this fisherman who went to get the bananas but he's lying on his back and he's clearly deceased and he's in a pool of his own blood many years after this incident there was a lighthouse keeper that was assigned to work on this island and he brought his family with him they were staying in the main house of the lighthouse and it was going fine for the first couple of days they were there but at some point captains of vessels that would drive past this island relied on that lighthouse noticed that the light wasn't on and so they reported it to the mainland and a search party was sent out to check on the lighthouse keeper and his family to make sure that they had all their supplies and that they were okay when they got to the lighthouse they find the entire family is dead in their bed and the only clue they had were these puncture marks all over the bodies of these deceased lighthouse keepers and an open window. So what killed these people that went to this island? Technically they died from a poison that literally melts your organs within 60 minutes of coming in contact with it. But that poison comes from a very famous venomous snake called the golden lancehead viper that only exists on this island. They exist nowhere else in the world and so this island has been dubbed snake island and since nobody goes to this island the lancehead viper population has exploded. They are thriving on this island. In fact, researchers say that there's at least 3,000 of these venomous snakes that live on this island. For every one square meter of the island, there is a snake, which means if you're on this island, you're always within one meter of something that can kill you. And these snakes aren't just on the ground either because their primary food source are birds. And so the snakes have begun to live in the trees and catch the birds that land in the trees. Meaning, if you happen to be walking on this densely forested island, you'd be surrounded almost 360 degrees by these wickedly venomous snakes that if you're a bit you have 60 seconds to get antidote if you don't you're doomed 100% of the time nowadays the only people that go on this island are the navy who replaces the batteries in the lighthouse which is automated because it's too dangerous to be there and they go once a year to replace those batteries. Researchers occasionally go there and you have poachers that try to go and catch some of these snakes because they're so rare and they can sell on the black market for 10 to 30,000 US dollars but many of these poachers that manage to sneak onto the island just get bit by these snakes and die. So there you go. Karma. In early 1945, during World War II, the British decided they wanted to take back Ramria Island from the Japanese. Ramia Island is a very large total flat island off the coast of Burma that was a great staging location to fly air campaigns onto the mainland. So it was a great air base and the British had actually owned this island but Japanese had taken it back from them in 1942. And so here they are in 1945 looking to take back the island. 
So on January 21st, 1945, British and India infantry stormed the beaches of Ramri to try to take back. As soon as they land, they have all this naval artillery support just bombing the crap out of the airbase. And it was just a matter of time before they overwhelmed the remaining Japanese, but the Japanese do not want to surrender. And instead, they give up the airbase that they were on, so the British take that back. And the remaining thousand Japanese soldiers just start retreating to the opposite end of the island to where they there was a larger battalion of Japanese soldiers that they could meet up with but the only issue with this particular retreat was they would have to go through 10 miles of mangrove swamp where there's poisonous spiders and insects and deep mud making it almost impossible to move but they're determined and they head off into the swamp but what the Japanese were not ready for is what Ramri Island is famous for a creature that makes poisonous snakes and spiders and insects look like child's play and they were walking directly into its den the British troops decide we're not going to chase them into the swamp and instead what they did is they set up boats blocking positions outside of the swamp. If any of the Japanese tried to escape they would be waiting there and so the only way the Japanese could get out of there would be to go to the absolute other end. 10 miles away where the Japanese counterparts were. So that night, as the British are just kind of hanging out in their boats, staring at the swamp, they start hearing screams coming from inside of the swamp. It's Japanese soldiers. Then you hear gunfire and then silence. And then it would start all over again. All over this huge swamp was just screams, gunfire, silence, screams, gunfire, silence. And the British are watching, like, do we have troops in there? What was going on in there is defined by the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest massacre of humans caused by animals and not just any animals saltwater crocodiles these massive man-eating crocodiles can weigh up to a thousand kilograms or 2200 pounds they can grow up to seven meters in length or about 23 feet in length and national geographic has labeled these crocodiles as the most likely to eat a human of all animals and ramry island has the larger population of saltwater crocodiles in the world and they all live inside of the swamp that the japanese had gone onto a lot of them were bleeding from the battle they were in and so they they were literally alerting hundreds of saltwater crocodiles to their location. Saltwater crocodiles are notoriously night hunters and so what probably happened is the Japanese got inside of the mangrove. The crocodiles were immediately aware of their presence but they waited until night time before they started having a feeding frenzy and all over the course of the night a number of Japanese soldiers had jumped out the side of the swamp exposing themselves to the British so about 20 of them were captured and they said that they were completely surrounded by these crocodiles that everywhere you look they were growling huge crocodiles eating one person and as soon as they were done they would just charge after you and eat you and at the end of their retreat when the japanese did get to the other side of the swamp only 500 of their thousand made it out the other side and so to this day people stay far away from ramry island because there are so many of these barney and salt war crocodiles that have no issue ripping you to shreds on November 14th, 2018, John Chow hired two fishermen to take him out to this little island in the Indian Ocean. The fishermen were not excited about this, not only because it was illegal to take him out to the island, but because the last time some fishermen had gone to this island, they had both died but the fishermen needed the money so they went with John and they drove under the cover of darkness to this island and they anchored a little way offshore. The next morning when the sun came up John asked the fishermen to take him in a little bit closer but the fishermen refused so John puts a kayak in the water and he begins paddling into the island and as he gets closer to the actual beach he sees someone coming out of the forest who has a face painted yellow and they're screeching at the top of their lungs and John yells out that he's not threatening them and he just wants to come ashore and talk to them. And then a wave of people with yellow painted face comes charging out of the wood line and starts firing arrows in his direction. So John in a panic turns around and paddles right back out to the fishing boat. Later that day, John tries to make another attempt at landing on this island and communicating with the people that live there. So he takes his kayak. He goes down a little bit further away from where those people had emerged from the tree line early in the day and shot him with arrows. He figured he was a little bit farther out of the arrow range. This way he lands his kayak, he gets out and the same group of people come out further down the beach where they had been before. They see John, they all start looking at each other and they start screeching and running down the beach towards John. John stands there until they come all the way up to him. They don't shoot him with arrows but they take his kayak and they don't really know what to make of him and they started to speak to each other in another language. John doesn't understand and then at some point a child pulls a bow and an arrow and fires a 
bow directly at John and he was holding a Bible and he stopped the arrow with his Bible and at that point John is like okay I gotta go and he jumps in the water and without a kayak John has to swim a mile to get back to the fishing boat. The whole time these people are firing arrows in his direction as he swims back out to the boat and so the next day on November 16th he told the fishermen he wanted them to drop him off and he would swim and he wanted them to leave and be completely out of sight. The fishermen did not want to do this but John reassured them that he was going to be just fine. He knew what he was doing and so the fishermen dropped him off and they leave. The next day when the fishermen come back to collect John they see these people with painted yellow faces out on the beach dragging his body by the rope. No one knows exactly what happened to John and how they killed him. There's lots of the speculation on how it went down but it's too dangerous for anyone to go back and retrieve his body. And so his body remains at the North Sentinel Island. And the few hundred people that live on the North Sentinel Island that were responsible for killing John Chow, they're referred to as the Sentinelese and they are unbelievably primitive. They are completely cut off from the modern world. They live a hunter-gather lifestyle. They have no conception of agriculture. They haven't even discovered fire yet. They literally have to wait for the lightning to strike and they run and collect the embers and try to keep the embers alive. Researchers believe that the Centralese are direct descendants from the earliest human ancestors that came out of Africa and as much as we like to learn more about the Centralese we probably won't because they aggressively resist outside contact and as you've seen with today's story you understand if you try to talk to them they'll end up killing you. But that'll be it for today's video. If you liked this video please consider hitting that subscribe button. Also please do consider hitting that notification button so you're notified when I upload and comment below which one is your favorite stories and yeah goodbye